so what I have here is a website that I designed that um, on one of, I think this week I, I, I tried to send it out to the group and you can see the URL um, and I can, I can send it back to you in case you can't see that, but that's it. Now, if you go to this website, it's one I'm designing and it's gonna be for the A plus lecture series but it's got everything you need right here. So it's sort of gonna be the Walmart of your A plus, anything you need. So as you know, today, we're going to be doing lecture number two, uh, managing files and folders in disk and windows. Uh, if, you, if you didn't have the activity, if you click on that, hopefully that'll show on your screen uh, with the actual activity that, you could, that we're gonna be doing today. Okay. That's gonna to be in there. Um, okay. And let's say last week you weren't able to attend, April 21st, you can, you can click on that to see the recorded lecture that we did from last week. And as we record this one today, that will be archived as well, so you can always keep a pros of that. I've also uh, included some other recommended videos that's on the topics that we're talking about. Um, so you can just sort of... Yeah. Oh, you went a little muddy there, Derek. That's okay. Uh, I'm going to get out of that because I just played a video of one of these. Can you still see the screen? You still see my web page here? Yes. I just okay. saw audio for a sec. So, yeah, that's okay. If you click on the video, it'll play a video about editing the registry, and I'll be putting those up as well. So there's supplemental materials about the very things that we're going to be covering in our course. I'm adding that as well. But these are the actual lectures here and I'll be adding to this group here. I've also included a form so that you can put your name, your email, phone number, and you can hit me up and this goes directly to my email. So if we're going through a lecture or if you want to, as you can see, you can ask me questions about maybe course content that you're going through or that you want to come on campus and do something live, you can fill out this form, hit submit, it comes to me, I can respond back to it and that way we can always keep in touch on a lot of ways. But at the top, I've also included, you know, my email here and just some additional resources and stuff like that. But if you keep that URL and bookmark it, um, you have a forum to where, you know, you'll be able to get documents, other information, submit information to me, and you can do it all at this one location. And this is not a finished product. I will keep building it out based on the feedback I'm getting so that you can go to one place and and get what you need while you go through this A-plus course. Make sense? Yes. yes. Is, that the, is this the preferred method for you, Derek, for uh, scheduling the lab in person? Um, I'm not going to, you, you had indicated earlier that, hey, look, uh, I'm calling different numbers, I'm not sure, whatever. So I'm trying to give you like the Walmart of your okay. A-plus. Yeah. So yeah. now that's I just that versus a text, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. Now I'm not saying that you can't call the other number and things like that, but I just want you to know that I am building something. So you definitely will get a response back. Okay. Uh, and I can put additional information like, you know, when it comes to a plus, I want you to be able to say, okay, here's a number I can call, or here's a place I can go uh, to get in touch with, with Derek and, um, and so if I, if I need to, I can add my, you know, my phone number on here, put that type of information so that you can text me directly. And you don't have to go through emails. You don't have to go through all these other forms. You just come to this one website. It's mm -hmm. all there. So now, when, you re when you, I'm sorry, when you respond on this, does it come back to our Asher email? We just got sent out a, an email that where we now all have asher.edu emails. So when you respond, how will that come back to us? Well, if you were utilizing this form, once you put whatever email, whether it's Gmail or your Asher account, okay. I'm going to okay. respond to that email that you put in right there. Okay, fair that's enough. Your, okay. That's, that's your email that you put in there. And it'll come into my inbox and I'll reply to that. Okay. And, and also, just so I'm clear, things that you want, things that you may not be getting, things that you that you might say, hey, you know, I'm really interested in that. So that form isn't just so like, I got a question about something I'm reading in my book, I don't understand it. That's 
that's certainly what you can use it for. But also that form is say, hey, can we do this? Can we do this? Or I would like to have X, Y, Z, or can you put this up here? I'm going to be building it out. Because like one of the things we talked about last week is me circling back and doing some of the, uh, the labs that are actually in your course as opposed to these activities we're doing. Well, here's the place I'll put those videos that I'll circle back and do. Follow me? Yes. 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 So you don't have to like, okay, what is this? And I'll make it very distinct on this website. Okay, which ones are the book activities and which ones are the, uh, the course labs that you're going through in your course? And I'll, it'll be very distinct. So you don't have to think about, oh, what's this lab and that lab and what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll organize it so that, like I said, this site is not finished. This is just based on where we're at right now. But it's gonna, I'm going to continue to build it so that when you come here, you're like, I'm good. I'm golden. Because if I miss the lab, I can go back and go watch back it. to it and, and watch it. And, and, De and Derek, you, I know when you and I talked at length, uh, uh, about going through the labs, I, I recall that you said you're gonna you're gonna walk through step by step as if, I mean, off of that lab sheet, just like we were there. And that right. being the case, you know, those things include scenarios, those things include assessments. So will you be walking through that, giving us uh, stop the video, and then and then give right. us the answers to the the preferred answers to all of that as well? Yes, yes. Okay. In those in Perfect. those in those course ones. Because I think what we t what we agreed upon is for me to go through and identify the ones instead of doing all the labs, identify the ones that that will require for the end and very pertinent. And I'll do those labs, and then I'll, like I'll be submitting the an answer guides to those. Fair but tonight, enough. Tonight we're going to do it a little bit different than we did the first week. As and I want you guys, like I said, if you can see this activity. Uh, we're going to be doing this activity, you know, uh, in this activity, you will add and configure storage devices for virtual machines and use the management tools. So, and then we'll be going through, the, I'll be going through this document here. Okay. Okay. And, and, and I'm actually going to do the lab. Now, unlike last week, I was actually doing the lab live. I've already done the labs and I've made videos of them. So now you can watch it. And then I'll be talking as, as, as the lab is being displayed and, and I'll make, that'll be more apparent. But tonight, I want you guys, if you have the document in front of you, that's great. If you printed it off or whatever. But what I really want you to focus in on is watching me do the lab. And let's talk about it. Let's engage. Because I really want to change the focus from you trying to follow these bullet points. I want you to learn. I want you to learn and, and get a real good grasp of what I'm doing and how the lab goes. And then you can be remoted in and try to do it yourself. So tonight, I just want you to kind of kick back and focus in on learning. Let's, let's just get that learning component. Don't worry about trying to do the lab yourself. Focus in on it. I can stop, I can stop the video at any point that it's playing and we can have a discussion about what's going on or what have you. So it'll, it's going to save us time uh, and we're going to be able to go through it. So I hope that makes sense. I want to go, I want to get away from you guys just reading, doing labs, and then asking questions. I really want to go back to you going through the lab with me, then going back and mastering it yourself. And that way you can focus on learning as opposed to trying to figure everything out as we go through it. So if you have your document, that's great. But if you don't have your document with you, I'm going to be going through the lab, reading it, your job is just to focus in on the learning aspect. What are we doing? What's the point? What's going on here? What are we trying to accomplish? So that when you do the lab, it makes sense to you and you can execute it, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, more efficiently. And it also will save you time because you have a pretty good idea of what you're trying to accomplish in this lab. But this is what we're actually going to be doing today. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch screens and I'm going to start playing the video. Well, before I do, are there any other questions that we have about maybe the website, uh, kind of what it's for, um, and things like that? Does that make sense to anyone, or does this seem like a... Yes. Yes. It, it, it sounds really good to me, Derek. I really appreciate you doing this on my, you know, for my part of it. I just have what I, I, since this is my first, well, 
I guess our first lab together. Do you have preferences, Derek, on like if we have a question, should we use the chat box to raise our hand or just do we chime in kind of like what we've been doing with Edward? Just, just free flow of chime in, chime in, and then I can pause it and let's just talk because that's one of the ways we're really going to learn is because you may have a question that all of us want to talk about. And, and I really think that the way we're going to do it tonight is going to save us time anyway. So we're going to have more time to be able to talk, slow down, engage, and move through these labs in a more effective way. And, uh, and like I said, if you, if you have this link, you can, uh, on the night of the lecture, if you just click on that link, it will open up Zoom and join you right into the, to the discussion as well. Yeah, that was nice. Thank you. Yeah. So you don't have to think about like going back to my emails, trying to find that link, stuff like that. If you just bookmark this website, whenever that lecture rolls around, you just click that, opens and brings you right into the into the lecture. Okay. So again, little bells and whistles that I'm trying to add will help everybody. Um, you know, and if you you join the lab late and you want to just open that up, you can click on that. It it brings up the document and you can follow along. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to switch screens again, because I'm going to actually start, we're going to go ahead and start the, uh, start the lecture. Um, I don't want anyone to feel like there are certain rules Just jump in there. And if you got a question, I can pause it and then we can start it right back up. So I'm going to switch screens and, and start, start the lab, the actual lab. I'm about to switch screens here. And just let me know, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're going to get ready to start. So, you know, before I get started, before I click this, just kind of real quick, um, uh, the scenario in this activity, you will add and configure storage devices for virtual machines and using management tools. So this actual, this first one is an exercise on using some of the Windows um, um, management tools. And so um, what they're wanting us to do is they're wanting us to, um, this first activity is for us to uh, look at some file, uh, Windows Explorer, um, kind of navigate through some of the Windows, some of the Windows features um, and, and look at the navigation and the structure of, wi of windows and things of that nature. Um, so there, are, I did this live, so there may be times where you have to, you'll be watching a video and you'll see my mach machine actually loading up and things like that, and we have to kind of sit through that, but um, I'm going to go ahead and get it started. Because if you remote in, this is this will be your experience. So I want you to kind of see it as I'm doing it. Now, what they're going to be asking us to do is to go into Windows Explorer. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the local disk, uh, some of its features. Um, how it lays out. We got, in this particular one, I'm opening up Windows 7, and we're going to compare some of the features of Windows 7 to Windows 10 and how it lays out on that. So I'm <clears throat> now, again, in the activity, it actually has the passwords and everything that you need to log in. You key that in up that's on your activity worksheet. Um, and you'll be able to get in as I have there. So they're asking me to go to the uh, Windows Explorer icon, which I've done there. Then they're asking me to navigate to C and look at the way it expanded out and look at C. And they want you to focus in on sort of like, look at the layout, program, uh, users, windows, um, kind of look at that. That's the emphasis on that. Then they said, okay, now notice that it has a libraries uh, link that shows you documents, music, videos, 
and things of that nature. Then they're asking me to click on the, the admin. And when you click on the user account, you see what lays out in the user account. You've got contacts, downloads, and things of that nature. That's kind of what the focus is on there. Now on that, they said click Alt. When you click Alt, you, let me go back real quick just so you can kind of see that. Um, when I click on Alt, I click on the Alt command and then it shows you that tools uh, menu and then you go to folder options and now they're saying, okay, in order to view and to be able to view files that you couldn't see, uh, you can click on, let me just pause here so that I don't get away from everyone. But what they're asking us to do is is to uh, look at some actual, some files that you could not see ordinarily because of default, uh, Windows will not allow you to see like hidden files or hidden directories and things like that. Now, just before we go any further, why would you want to, what would be a scenario just from the group why would this even be necessary? Why would you need, what, can you give me a scenario to why you would even want to view a hidden file or to view a hidden directory as a technician? When would this come into play? Just maybe from your experience, can you tell me why we, why we would even, what would be the point of this anyway? Sometimes uh, uh, down like a DLL file or, or, or some kind of, um, you know, file that, that might be causing a problem with a, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see, or a cabinet file, a cab file, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and, that, and that's a great point, Mike, and that's, that's excellent. Anyone else in the group have any reasons why you would maybe want to look at files that were hidden or directories that you could not see? Security reasons? Security, yes. Yeah. After cleaning well, malware on your computer? There you go. There you go. That's what I was really looking for. Something confidential? Right. But if there are times where you might run your, a, a computer could have gotten hit with a virus, for example, and you're trying to clean it, and you run it through that, and you, d you don't have uh, hidden files displayed, so every time that cleaner is running through there, and if you've identified a particular directory as the problem, this is one way you can see if that information has been cleaned or what have you. Oh. And you're going to see this actually in your textbook and when your certifications is that this is a troubleshooting tool. And that's why they want to familiarize you with it. So again, uh, what I've done is I went to the tools. Uh, I hit Alt. It displayed tools. I clicked on View. Uh, went into Advanced Setting and, and the in the files that I'm actually going to click on now here that you're going to see here in a second is I'm clicking on show hidden files and folders uh, hit I'm also going to uh, uncheck hide extensions for known file types file types and then there's another button for hide protected operating systems once I uncheck those you're going to see the results of what it's going to display and they're going to show you that you're going to be able to see things that you couldn't see before in that file. So now you can see, as you point out, you see an NT user data file that you couldn't see before. App data is being displayed here. Uh, now we're going to navigate. You can see now that you see a recycle bin that you couldn't see before. Uh, program data was invisible. Um, system volume information in the page sys files. Now, this is just examples of things that weren't visible before that are now visible. Now, Going back to what Mike was talking about, the DLL files, we're going to kind of look at some of those as well. We go into System32, we scroll down, and it's going to show you some of those DLL files that you could not see before. Um, that's in the System32, but that's a System64, and it's showing some DLL files. So by turning on that switch, if you were running antivirus software, you could maybe see if those files have actually been cleaned. I apologize. Didn't mean to stop that. Uh, I meant to pause that video. Uh, so that's one reason why you would do that is because 
in a real world scenario, you may get a question like, what tool would you utilize and what, uh, if you're trying to ensure that your, your system has been cleaned of, of, of a particular, uh, you ran your malware program and you wanna ensure before you uh, report back to your superiors what you've done to ensure that that has been taken care of. And this is one of the things that you will be able to say, hey, I actually went in, I, I, I looked at the hidden files, I made sure all that was out of there and I'm pretty, uh, and I can make a, a, you know, a recommendation that, you know, I've done all that I can do to make sure that this, this has been taken care of. So that's a practical application of how you would utilize that tool. And you may see that from time to time, uh, maybe on your final or some courseware, or uh, especially when you're going for your certifications, they, they want to know if, yeah, you learn how to do this, but when would you utilize it? When would you utilize this tool in order for it to, uh, so just keep that in mind as we're going through it, like not just learning how to do this, but when are the scenarios where I would use, utilize this tool? Because that's what you really want to be able to master when you come out of that. Okay. So now, let me pause this for a second. So now if you are following along in your guide, we're actually at step two. And uh, we're going to start applying some virtual hard disks uh, to the machine. Um, so I want you to know that if, I don't know how many of you have worked in a virtual environment before, but when you log in and remote in, we're in a virtual uh, setting, but just like you can take two hard drives and put them in your own machine, in a virtual environment, you can add hard drives to simulate hard drives in a virtual environment. So that's what we're actually gonna do here in this next scenario here. I think I might have actually started replaying the same one. I think I need to switch. Okay, let me let me stop this one here and I'm going to share a screen with you that's actually going to start the next part on step two. Um, so just bear with me a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this video and start the next one. So let me back up a little bit because I want you to see me from the start. So now what I've done, what I'm, what I'm doing here is, as you can see, I already have the Hyper-V manager going. Um, I've gone to where it says SCSI controller. I selected that. I go to hard drive and then I'm gonna click add. That's where I'm at now because I'm actually adding a hard drive in a virtual environment. It has its hard drive that's running the operating system here, but I'm gonna add two hard drives to it. So as you see me doing it, I'm actually, I select SCSI controller, hard drive, click add, and then you can watch me as I finish the setup on, on that. And I'm gonna do two hard drives. Select new, click next. I'm gonna leave it on dynamically expanding. Uh, I'm gonna rename this to what the lab says, RAID A. And then I'm going to actually store that hard drive in a folder called temp. And then I'm gonna change instead of 127 gigs, I'm gonna change and make that hard drive only eight gigabytes and finish. And I'm gonna repeat this process again for the second hard drive. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to pause it. Because what I want you to look at, we're here, here over, on the left. There's, the, there's the, the initial hard drive that was already there that we set up. But I just added two more, RAID A, RAID B. Those are two additional hard drives I just added in there. Now, just because I added them in this, in this virtual environment, once I actually start the, um, the Windows 10 program, it hasn't detected, it's going to detect that I added two hard drives. And I want you to see what happens when it, when it does that. So I've added them as a settings permission in the Hyper-V Manager. But once we actually launch Windows 10, it's got to detect them. We're going to have to format those hard drives and do everything so that we can utilize them. Any questions so far? Can you? you there is one extension, the VHDX. Well, I'm going to show that to you here in a second. Because oh, okay. if, you, if you notice right here, those hard drives, I made them 8 gigabytes, right? Each hard drive is 8 gigs, correct? So, for example, this is RAID B. So it stores that hard drive in a VHDX with an extension to, to let you know that's a virtual hard drive. Oh, okay. Virtual hard drive, RAID B. Now, it actually stores that in a file that's eight, 8 gigabytes in size. So if I wanted to delete that, um, I would go over to, let's say I'm done with this lab, I'm finished with it or whatever, but I don't want two hard drives eating up eight gigs on my, I can go over here to C, CompTIA Labs, Temp, and I can delete that file and that releases that space on my hard drive. Okay. Because what, by creating two eight gigabytes, that's literally 16 gigs of hard drive that I'm now utilizing on my host, on, my, uh, on this computer you see out here. That just took up eight gigabytes of hard drive space on it to work in a virtual environment. Okay. Now, to do the lab, that's great. But if I, like I said, when I complete the lab, I can go back and I can delete, I can go to that location and delete that hard drive. And then uh, if I want to utilize, I'm going to have to create another one, but as you, it's going to make more sense as you actually see me um, connect those to my Windows 10 environment and going forward. But that's where that hard drive is located. So if you're actually attaching hard drives, uh, make sure you don't make one that's like 127 gig because it's going to eat up your hard drive space. So I made it 8 gigabytes. So now we're going to keep going. Uh, before we move on, Derek, just because uh, I may forget, when we go back and we have no more use for these virtual hard drives, should we, uh, uh, God, what am I trying to say? Is it going to, uh, do we need to defrag our drive or does it, or is the, does the virtual environment go to the end of a drive and so that we don't have to worry about defragging? No, no, it, 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 it does not affect your whole system at all. It's all working inside of that virtual environment. So you won't have to defrag your system or whatever. You just can, you know, you can delete that hard drive, you know, and it will just recoup that space. But in terms of everything that's happening, it's happening inside that virtual environment. So Okay, well, I misunderstood that part. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Because in a virtual environment, if that virtual machine got hit by a virus, it's not going to affect your whole system, you know unless for somehow it breaks out of that virtual environment. So whether you're, it, so defragging and things of that nature will, really won't be necessary to your host system. And I can, at the end of the lecture, I'll go back and talk about host and virtual and things like that in a second. But um, if you guys have enough time, I'll actually show you guys and I'll do it live so you can actually, I can answer some of these questions a little bit more fully kind of walk you through this whole virtual settings. But what we're doing now is before we open up Windows 10, we're actually doing, we're configuring it and adding hard drives. And this is all part of settings. Once we get these done, then we can go back into PC2, open it up. And because it one of the things I didn't show you is that you see where it says memory here? When I clicked on that, it wasn't set at 2048. It was that much lower 
I changed it so they can use two gigs of memory so Windows 10 can run a little bit faster. So if you're ever doing a lab and you don't and you look at the memory settings and if it's set at like really low, you can come over here and change it to 4,000. That'll give you four gigs of memory or 2,000. That's two gigs of memory. You can change those settings so that when you launch Windows, it can perform the way you want. So that's what we've done is we said, okay, before we open up Windows, we configured it to have two additional hard drives at eight gigs apiece. The memory is at 2,000. But when I'm done with the lab, I can click revert in the settings and it'll put everything back the way it was when I first started. So that I don't have to go back and manually try to uh, change everything and get it back to the way it was. But I'll show you that a little bit later on. So we're gonna keep going. So now we're going to uh, actually go, now that we've got it configured, I'm gonna to connect to it. And this is where I mean it. And, and I only showed you that part up there because on the view part, you wanna make sure that the enhanced setting is off. Uh, it, it just runs a lot better if you take enhanced, enhanced settings off. And I'm talking about this area here, that view right there. If you take it, uh, the enhanced settings, your virtual experience will run a lot faster. Despite what you're seeing here this evening, it will run a little bit faster. If you're following along, we're already on page 85. Um, we're actually beginning to, um, on step three, And what I really want you to key in on is once we get into Windows 10, I'm going to uh, go to disk management. And the moment I click on disk management, it's going to detect those two hard drives. And then we're gonna to have to go through a series of formatting those hard drives and making them usable in a virtual environment. Now, while we're waiting, one day I wanna go back and I wanna show each and every one of you how to create a virtual environment on your own PCs and how you can load Windows 10 on them. And I can do a tutorial on that so you can actually do those things on your own as opposed to having a remote in. And, um, that, I think that'll be extremely valuable because one of the advantages of the virtual environment is uh, once you create this, you can use it as a sandbox to play around and do things and learn. I have not only Windows 10, but I have virtual environments for Linux and stuff like that where I can play around and learn stuff and not affect my host machine. And I would love for you guys to be able to set up your own virtual environments and, 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 and do some of these on your own. Director, you mentioned that can we create, you said Windows 10, what can we create on a version home? Edition? I can show you how to take a home edition and make it professional. Okay. Uh, if you have Windows 10 Home, you can do virtual on Windows 10 Home, but I can show you guys how to upgrade your Windows 10 Home uh, to uh, Windows 10 Pro. Okay. Um, I probably would like for you guys to make an on-campus visit where I can show you how to do that. Okay. Thank you. And it won't be illegal. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that we do anything illegal, anything like that. Right. I'll just walk you through the process, you know. So I'm not, you know, going to do anything that's, you know, an infringement in any way. Mm -hmm. But as technicians, you want to know this because even, you want to know it even if you don't use it yourself. You want to be able to uh, provide services and client, you know, to your clients and to those that you come in as a technician, you want to know these skills and have these skill sets so that you can be able to, to do those. So again, it's, we're finally in, it's directing me to go to disk management. So I'm going to go to the start menu and I'm going to right click and I'm going to get my menu up once I right click on it and I'm going to go into disk management. Once I get there, 
you should see it detect those two hard drives. And then they're going to walk us through the process of actually setting up the hard drive and making it usable. Right now, I'm just waiting for it to come up. The machine I was using at home was a little bit slow. So some of these, uh, it's just a waiting game, but it will come up here in just a second. The disk management software. Hey, Derek. Uh, yes, I got a question. Uh, in order to make it faster, do we need a more RAM to get well, it? Well, yeah, you can. But one of the things is I did is, like I said, before I opened it up, instead of I set it for 2,000 for 2 gigs. And if you've been re reading in your A-plus book, 2 gigs is like the minimum for Windows 10. You really need to be running at about 4 gigs. So I set it for 2,048, which is 2 gigs. If I really wanted this to scream, I would have set it to like 4,096, would have been four gigs, and this lab would have been moving a lot faster. Uh, like my laptop has four, uh, four GB. So if I add more, like 16 or eight or 16, so it will be more feasible. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you really want to know that. So if you have a system that's only got four gigs on the host, then when you use two gigs, the host is going to use two gigs, and then your virtual is going to use two gigs. So you split your RAM in half. Okay. If you added more RAM to the host, and let's say you have 16 gigs, now you can open about three virtuals and run them all at two gigs a piece or four gigs or however you want to splice it. Okay. You follow me? So the yes. more RAM you have on your host, then you can start sharing it with your virtual environment. Now, on my computer, on uh, my laptop that I'm actually at tonight, I have like 24 gigs of RAM on it. So I really, I could have, if I had to ran this on, I could have set them much higher, like given each one of them eight gigs and these RAM and recorded them that way and they've been run a lot faster. But I didn't want to do a lot of this because I wanted us to talk about them because I wanted you guys not just to, you can see the slowness, you can see the performance, but you would think about that and say, oh, you know what? Before I open up something, I'm going to go into the settings and configure it the way I wanted to, to have the experience that I want to, especially if you start remoting in. When you remote in, before you open up a lab, you can actually go into the settings and configure it how you want. You'll say, okay, well, Derek, how much does the host have on this machine? I'll say, well, that machine has 16 gigs of RAM. You say, well, I'm just going to open up one virtual. I'm going to go in and set it up for eight gigs of RAM so that when I open up this virtual, it flies. Oh, Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then when you shut it off, just because you set it at eight, it's not utilizing the eight. You can go back and open up another virtual and set it at eight because it only is going to utilize it as you launch it. So you can set them up high, but not lo not launch them all at one time. Okay. So, so just, go ahead. So, so in this case, if it's not, not launch, that mean it's not using the memory. It's not using it. If it's not launched, it's not using it. Oh. You only start using it when you're launching it. I see. Okay. So you can just, the biggest thing is to know how much RAM the host has, and then you can configure each virtual as you see fit, and that will vary. So let me go ahead. Hmm. And so you can see it detected two, um, two hard drives, and you can actually see them. That's one of the hard drives that we added there. I think I scrolled down here in a second so you can see the actual second one, but it's going to, the rest of the lab is going to have a start to actually making this hard drive usable. And it's going to walk us through the steps on that. Okay. So new simple volume. Next. Leave the default at eight. It's gonna have us try, change the drive letter to drive L. Derek, how did the, how do we know, cause it didn't call it RAID A and RAID B. How do we know uh, uh, which drives we're working with? Okay, I'm gonna show you that here in a second. Okay. So 
So as you can see, it's formatting that, and it shows you that it's drive letter L right there. But I believe I'm going to take you into File Explorer and show you that now it's usable in our Oh, this is showing you that the difference in Windows 10 where it had libraries. Um, right here it says this PC, it had my computer on Windows 7, and we know Windows 7 has gone away, and on the uh, uh, Windows 7 it had libraries, but that was replaced with OneDrive. But I'm actually going to navigate you down here in a second so you can see that file we just added, uh, and you'll know that... Um, You actually can't see, but I'm eventually going to scroll down here to show you that that drive L is what we just added as a hard drive. Basically, what they're doing here is just showing you some security features on um, the documents folder, showing that there's no users added. And on Windows, uh, you know, we're going to go into properties. And they're just showing you that when you go to security, there's no individual user. They're just system users um, and the privileges on that. But if you're looking at the security of, of your folders, they're just showing you how to navigate to see who has ownership and what kind of privileges are on that. Um, Now, let me just stop it here because if you're following along, we're actually on step five. Now, Mike, to go back to your question, um, later on in this lab, they're going to take you back and we're going to look, we're going to do a lot more with that file we just created and we gave it the drive letter L. But in the meantime, instead of doing it through disk manager, what they want to show you is that you can do some of the same things you could use, uh, not disk manager, but disk management. We're going to do some of those same things, but they're going to switch on. They're switching up on you in the group, and they're going to show you how to uh, use um, some command lines in order to be able to uh, uh, work with some of this directory structure and some of these files that we've been working at now. So, if you if you guys are wondering, in the lab we're on step five, and they're going to have you navigate through it using some command lines but we're not getting away from what we did uh, setting up those virtual hard drives. They're just gonna show you more and more tools. We've already looked at disk management, but now we're gonna use command line to execute some of those uh, uh, same things that we could do through disk management. So um, I want you to kind of follow along because they're just gonna take you into a command line and, and show you some command lines. So here, the first thing they're going to do is say CD peer peer. If you notice there, it took you back one directory. And then if you hit CD backslash, it takes you to the root of C. And that's what you're seeing going there. Now they're going to say clock type in directory. It shows you the navigational structure. Um, and I'm going to pause here because what they're doing is, is they're saying, okay, in the directory, it shows you a list of the directory. But if you didn't know you could, didn't know a lot about the directory command, you can go directory backslash question mark, and it will give you what you're looking at here is a bunch of switches. So now we're going to do the next uh, command I'm going to run is if you are in command line, how can you see the hidden files? So this command we're about to run is going to let you see uh, the hidden files. Not We looked at hidden files through the GUI interface earlier, now we're looking at them through command line. What version of DOS does Windows 10 run on now? You know? And that's a good question. Um, what version of DOS? I, I'm going to have to look that up because I don't know that off the top of my head, but I will get you, I will get you an answer on so that. If, if it can that's, cool. that's fine. 
if we can type VR version, it doesn't give any version. Command yeah. VR. Well, it may, but I'm going to have to look it up. But the version of DOS, what he's asking specifically of what version of DOS is Windows 10 running. And I don't want to just spout something off the top of my head and not know it because I hadn't even thought to look at that. But I'm sure I could find out what version of DOS run. But I do know that the version of DOS we're running, some of the older versions like uh, copy and X copy have been deprecated. Exactly. Deprecated. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Right, and they're using RoboCopy. So that's a very good question. I understand where you're going with that. And, and that's actually in our lab that, okay. that we're going to be going through. Cool. Um, but what I was trying to show you is that you can see you can see recycle bin, which you couldn't see before. You can see uh, some of the system file information. You see some of the sys files. So running that command uh, you can see page file. You couldn't see that before. When I ran that command, when I ran the command, this command here, directory, and I looked at, once I did help, it showed me if I ran backslash A colon HS, that shows me the hidden files. So now I've got that list of the hidden files. So you can see that you can use, if for some reason Windows 10 was giving you a problem, you can utilize this tool and say, you know what? Instead of me trying to go this way, I'm going to go in the command line, and I can run these command lines and get some of the same information in command line. They want you to know as technicians that you got more than one way to retrieve and to troubleshoot uh, than you may think. And so you may see that question like, what tool would you use if this management for some reason isn't working properly? And then you were like, well, I can go in the command line and retrieve and find this type of information. So they're just walking you through that. So here we're going to get into, um, this is a copy command. Now this goes back, I ran a copy command, you can follow it and you can see this. That copy command, it, it looks like it's copying, but you see all these errors. Because again, like we were talking about earlier, this version of DOS is not going to use those old deprecated commands. Um, and at the end of this, you're going to see that even though it's running these, it's going to show you that there's zero uh, files that were actually copied into the folder that I was trying to copy them into. Whenever you're copying, you got to have a source that you're copying, then you got to type in the destination. They don't have that Raiders. They never have that online. Well, yes, and I also ordered, I think I ordered a, like, a gallon of wires for you. Okay, you can see here, um, zero files were actually copied. And I'm actually going to go to that folder now, because I was trying to copy them into that lab files, okay. well, and I'm demonstrating. I can't, I can't help that that there's no files that were actually copied there into that alpha. I'm not sure who that is, but if someone could you mute your mic uh, background. So now I'm trying to copy it and it said there was one file copy. I ran that command and there was a data file that it did copy, but I want to, when I open this up, I want to show you what happened and explain that. So I'm going to pause the video once I show you this. Look at that. So what happened there, because of the command I ran, or that they asked me to do, it was called xcopy um, c lab files. That was my source. And I was trying to copy it in, and the command I typed in was l um, <clears throat> data. So it created a data file, but all the files that it copied, it dumped it inside the data file. That's not what I wanted. But by copying that command, yeah, there's a one file copy, but everything you see in there was dumping that information inside the data file. That can happen. So you got to be, what they're trying to say is that you got to really have a command of, of, of how to use these command lines because you may not get the results you want. So they're just kind of walking you through it. Now, this next command we're about to run is going to be an X copy command, and the target is going to be lab files, and it's going to move it into L data but they're going to use some switches. Now, 
if you get a chance, you can go at home, you can go in, you can type in command, run it, and you can type in um, X copy and then backslash question mark and it'll give you a bunch of switches. The switches we're gonna run on this one is backslash S, backslash E, and backslash Y. Now the E is going to allow you to not only copy, but it's gonna also allow you to copy with the directory structure. Now, and the Y that we're gonna run here in a second, um, and I'll explain the Y, but the Y is going to allow it so that if you, if you copied some information in there before and it sees a file with the same file name and it's recopying it, it's not prompting you every time to ask you, do you want to overwrite? The Y is saying, yes, go ahead and overwrite the copies. But I'll show you that here in a second uh, when I run this video. Because before I do that, I'm going to run X copy and then I'm actually going to copy uh, content into that folder right there. I'm deleting that file out. I'm gonna go back into command and run an X copy command, which has a target of lab files, which has a bunch of files in it. And then I'm going to copy them to that directory we, we created called L. And then I'm gonna create a folder that doesn't exist. Um, and I'm gonna call that folder or that directory data. That's what I'm doing there. And it, it's going to appear that it had copied it perfectly, but there's going to be a problem with it, which I'll demonstrate after I cop, after it copied. So it's copying it in there, and I'm going to navigate back to that folder so you can see it on uh, this interface here. Uh, I'm going to take you back, and I'm going to show you the problem with that because it looks like it's a good copy, and it's copying all the files, but it really isn't doing exactly what I want. So first it said zero copied files. The next one said one copy file with, that dumped in here. And I believe this command is gonna show 58 copies file, which is still not all the data that I want. So it shows you 58 copies, files copied. Now I'm gonna take you to that folder and show you what actually copied. It created the directory called data. Now that looks good. But the problem with that is it doesn't show you the directory structure because there should be some other directories underneath that data folder if it copied all the lab files. So it copied the files, but it only, it didn't have the, um, the data structure in it or the directory stru structure in it. So that still didn't work the way I wanted it to work. And I'll show you the difference when I run this command here and put those switches on it. I'm saying, you know, um, the E is going to say copy the directories with it. And don't prompt me every time you see a file that's already been copied to it, just rewrite over it. And then I'll take you back into the directory uh, structure where you can actually see the difference between what I just copied and what I'm copying now. You know, since we're waiting for it, I think that the last door, I think it would be six point something before window 3.1, I think, or 3.0, like six dot. I'm definitely going to look that up. <laughs> uh, hey, Derek, is there, a, we don't have to get into it, but is there a switch or a pipe in, in the command line that is the equivalent of an MD checksum to make sure that you, your integrity is there on what you have done? Now, that's a great question. So, just to check and make sure you guys are paying attention, where would he go to find out if, if, if that's the case, based on what we've learned so far? Because you can do this right now at home. He could go in and he could type, open up command 
and he could go to um, directory and backslash question mark and it'll show you all the switches and everything you can do on that. And you can also do that for the copy um, and for every command. So if you want to know what you can do with copy, you can do backslash question mark and it'll show you all the switches available for that. X copy, the same thing. Uh, Robo copy, the same thing. So anytime you have a question of what can you do, that was the purpose of showing you that if you have a command and you don't know what you can or cannot do, you type in the command backslash question mark and it'll show you all the switches and next to each switch it'll show you what you can do on that and what's the equivalent to it. You following me, Mike? Well, yeah, I just, uh, sure. I mean, I, I guess one of those, uh, the bottom line is if we get the command right, we can trust it. It sounds like there's probably one of those that does that. Right. But what I'm trying to show you is a, is a bigger picture. Instead of answering that question outright, what I would like for you to do. Okay. And I'll demo that in a second, but that's a very excellent point because this, these labs only give you a taste of what you can do with some of these things. But as a technician, you're going to have to go back in especially before you go for your certification uh, and go back in and, 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 and look at some of these switches and maybe play around with them yourself because you never know okay. that may pop up, they may pop up on a certification. You're like, well, I never saw that in a lab. Mm. I never saw that in a question, but they're going to give you a taste of, Hey, look, if we show you something, don't just do the minimum, go back, and look at some of these other switches and do some things or maybe go and uh, look at some you uh, some YouTube videos and stuff about these things because they could pop up on a cert. They're just introducing you to it, but it's your responsibility to learn a little bit more about each one of these elements that we're discussing. So I'm glad that I'm getting these questions because when I was going through the program, I didn't just try to memorize questions. I looked at questions as a topic. And then I learned a little bit more about it on my own. And then I was much more versed and ready for my search than maybe someone who just kind of did a question and stopped right there. But Okay, fair enough. That's cool. But yeah. we'll, 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 I will address that. But I want you to start using, uh, utilize that form I had on my website and shoot me some of these so I can do a, a video on it and then get, and share it with the group. Okay? You got it. So this is a command that even if you didn't want to, this is a command you can run to see if it actually co uh, copied the directory structure, structure, and it's called tree, and then the destination, and you get this layout. So you're seeing that it not only copied the data, but the, it copied the folders underneath it. So you can do that in command line and don't even have to go and do what I'm about to show you now is by going into File Explorer. I'm going to fly, File Explorer and showing you the same thing I'm showing you in this environment here. So now it copied the directories. Before, it, the directories weren't there and it copied the content underneath it. And that's what the switch allowed it to do. Before, it was just, just files. Uh, and so I'm showing you that now it copied it the way I wanted to and you can view it through File Explorer or you can you can also view it in um, in the GUI interface. Now I'm going to stop this video. I'm going to put you guys on a break. Now this last, if you're following along your book, what I'm about to show you in this in the remainder of this video, which is only about two more minutes, it says on step seven. It says based on what you've learned. Here's they're giving you an exercise. They're not giving you any instruction. They just say, work out RoboCopy command to move files smaller than 10 kilobytes from the data folder to a folder called small data uh, folder on the L drive. They're saying, utilize what you've learned and work this out. So they're not walking you through it. They're saying, we've taught you enough that if you don't know what to know how to do this, the first step is that what you want to do, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Mike, in order for me to figure out 
how to do step seven, the first thing I had to do is I had to go into command and I typed in robocopy and I did backslash question mark to look at the switches because I'm looking for a switch that's going to allow me first to move files. I want to be able to move files, but I don't want to move files that are bigger than 10 kilobytes. I don't want to do that. So I had to go in. I didn't know. I, I went in the robocopy, backslash question marks, and I looked at the switches. And then I looked at the question, and then I figured out which switches to use in order to make this command execute. But what I've done to save time in this lecture is I went ahead and I'm, I'm showing you a copy of the actual answer uh, to this as well. So what I did was... I'm actually trying to copy and paste there, but I wasn't having much success. Um, but the command is that I figured out to do it was that command you see that Robocopy, source L data. I want to move it to small data, even though that file hasn't been created. And the switch is E, copy the data structure as well. That max that you see there is... Let me pause there for a second so you really understand. If you look at the switch, the switch says you use max and then you put the size that you want in, in, in bytes. So to get, I did the math on it and it's 10, uh, 10 240 in order to make files less than uh, 10 kilobytes. And once I put in the size, that's the max. Don't put any files larger than that so that's the command that I'm running now, which satisfies that question. So I'm going to type that in, and then I'm going to show you the results to see if it actually worked. And this is for question number seven in that. You guys will be doing them yourself, but I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that it is actually possible. But the idea was is that they you have, in college, you get exposed to information, okay? And then you have to understand it, but the third step is applying it, and that's what they're doing here, is I had to apply what I learned. And so it copied those files in there, and I'm gonna show you, did it actually work? So I'm going in there, showing it to you, and it created the folder small data, it created the de directory structure, but I'm going to scroll to the right. You will see no files in there larger than 10 kilobytes. You see seven in that. And I'm going to walk into some other uh, folders and show you the files underneath there that they copied them there as well. Can't really see it there, so I'm going to change the view so we can look at the file size. Just so you can see that there's no files larger than 10 kilobytes there. See, I got a 10 kilobyte there, but none larger than that. So the next one is saying, work out robocopy command to recreate the directory structure of C within lab files and put it in a folder called data layout. So all I want to do is I don't really want to copy files. I just want to create the, the directory structure. So I had to go back into robocopy and look at the commands and the switches that let me do that. But well, this time I made the max equal to one, which was less than any file size. There's no files less than one kilobyte. 
And so I'm going to show you that it actually did that, but it filtered out so they wouldn't actually copy files. So there it is. It created a, a data layout folder. It created that and it created the directory structure, but it did not actually copy any files. See, it, in the subdirectories, it, it did that. But, but because I did the max at one, I made the max too small for it to copy any file. So again, that is the application of what I've learned. If I didn't know it, I know I can go to RoboCopy, get help, show me switches, and then type in a command based on those switches. And um, that completes that part right there on that lab. So I want us to take a couple seconds to maybe ask a couple questions. I want to put us on like a 10 minute break and then we'll finish this last lab up. I got another video on that to, to go through that. This next part is pretty interesting because we're going to go back to uh, those hard drives that we created. We're not getting away from those. Uh, and we're going to actually create a RAID in a virtual environment. Um, any questions so far about what we've covered and kind of what we're going and, and what that lab was sort of introducing you to? I think the X copy, I never seen the command before in like the endorse of, it must be new. Actually, copy and X copy are no, the, the ro Sorry, the robo copy. Yeah. Must and you knew. And you will probably see a couple of those on your certifications about oh. RoboCopy oh. um, and things of that nature. But you, the idea is that you need to know what tools to utilize. If they ask you a question, they're going to be seeing if you know which tools to go into your toolbox and use to solve whatever, whatever scenario they give you. Um, you know, um, so again, they've kind of introduced you to, to quite a bit, but um, this next part is going to be a lot more interesting. I shouldn't say interesting, but it's, I think this is pretty cool stuff, that, these next couple of things that I'm going to show you, and then we'll be done with this virtual lecture for tonight. Now that you're kind of watching me through it, I do want to challenge you guys, though. At some point, you know, you watch me go through it, uh, print it out, or have me have you send a document or go to the website, remote in the campus, and do the labs yourself, because when you do them yourself, mm -hmm that's when it all starts to come together. Yeah, that's right. Right. But you're watching me and learning and, and, and going through, but when you do it yourself, you're like, okay, I remember him doing this X, Y, and Z, and you'll be able to do it. But I really want you guys to stick around for the second part because this is some pretty cool stuff, especially because what you're going to learn tonight, I want you to really try it on your own computers. If you have a Windows 10 Home uh, a professional, you can, and, and I, and, um, and maybe I can send you a link on the website on how to create your own virtual. Matter of fact, that's what I'll do. Is I'll just put a link where you can go in and it'll show you how to set up your own virtual machine and how to set it up so that you can start doing some of the things yourselves uh, with these drives. So when you see this next lecture, you might want to, um, or next video, you might want to start simulating some of this stuff at home. But let's I, meet. That, I, let's I was meet looking that. at that under Windows features, so I'll, I'll welcome that link. Absolutely, and, and it's pretty cool stuff. Um, matter of fact, have you guys, real quick before going on break, 20 seconds, I want to show you some. How many of you guys are familiar with Bash? No. Oh, no, that's the Linux not. thing, right? Yeah, it's the Linux Yeah, you know. Did not work. <laughs> okay, watch this. I'm going to share something with you. Watch this. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. And can y'all see me typing right now? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me where it says bash, bash here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can it watch? Now y'all know I'm running Windows 10 right now, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to show you how to configure your system so it does this. Watch when I click on Bash. You know what you're looking at? 
That's, no. Li that's Linux. I'm running Linux live. Wow. I can start running Linux commands. And that's awesome. Yeah. And so now Windows is, is starting to allow you to where you can, you don't have to download anything virtually. You literally can run this simultaneous with Windows 10. And so, you know, if you want to run some Linux commands and learn how Linux, um, there's a way, there's an app you can go down through the Windows Store, put the bash on it and run Linux uh, natively on your Windows 10 machine. So you, as a technician, so you can be learning Linux and keep your Windows 10 and really grow your skill sets. And so some of the commands that you, that's going to be through our course will be some Linux commands. I want you to know that if you're at home, you can remote in, because I set all the machines up here to run Bash. So when you remote in, you can do it. But I really would like for you to begin to utilize some of, the, some of these tools, you know, in your own environment. But I just wanted you to know there's a lot of cool stuff that we're going to be, I'm going to be exposing you to. And, you know, I may go off script and just say, hey, let's just take about five minutes and just run some Linux commands and show you some cool stuff you can do with Linux. And we don't have to, you know, uh, do it in a virtual environment. Just an FYI thing. So, again, that was a sidebar. But since you guys are part of this lecture, you kind of got that. But I'm going to show you that, and I can see you the link on the website on how to set it up. Okay. And I'll be, I'll be giving you more things that, you know, in addition to what, you know, some of the labs call for. So let's just take a quick break. Uh, let's meet in about, it's 7.20, meet back 7.30. I promise you these next couple of lectures are going to go a lot faster, um, and they're pretty cool. So right. we'll pick it up then, all right? 7.30. Okay. All right. Do we do now? Did you just close it? Okay, okay. All right. I'm down there by the things. Hey. Uh huh, I'm coming. I'm going to say, I'm going to adjust. Uh, okay.
So, Chris, what do you know about raids? Your, your mic's muted. Sorry, I, I was saying it's a acronym for um, random excess incremental disk or something like that. And um, it's used to uh, set up arrays depending on the number of disks you want to use and configure for um, disk arrangements. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, that's 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 exactly what it is. But just in layman's terms, um, what is going to what are well, there's different configurations of range you can do. But we today in our in our example, what we're getting ready to do is we added two hard drives, right? In a virtual yeah. environment. Okay, we added two. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a RAID, which is means that I have two eight gigabyte hard drives. I'm going to combine them, and they're going to appear as one hard drive. But here's what happens, you know, or what they're going to have us doing this is, even though that's 16 gigs, one is going to be a mirror. Okay. Um, so instead of combining them and making them a hard drive of 16 gigs, which is a RAID configuration of zero, if we did a RAID zero, that would Combining those two hard drives and making them appear as one, that would have been a 16 gig hard drive. But we're, what we're doing is, um, which is like a RAID 1, which is a mirror. Eight gigabytes we can put data on, and the mirror will back it up. So if one of them fails, I don't lose my data. Right. On a RAID 0, if I combine them as, as, as two eight gigabyte hard drives, and it fails, you lose your data. Yeah. all the data but here okay. so again in a virtual environment even though you're running virtually you can create hope two hard disk you can put data on one and have it backed up so if for some reason the software fails you like no worries i can it's been backed up on this other one so okay. it's it's just something good to know and i just want to take a second before we jump into further is that I really, really want you guys to really think, you know, because virtual, what we're doing in a virtual environment is really hot. So I really want you guys to learn more and more about uh, virtual machines because as technicians, you really want to kind of get a handle on how to configure them, how to set them up, because I've been in scenarios, and, you know, many of you might may not know this, but I've, I've said it before. I've worked in IT for over 25 years. And, tr and, and trust, you're going to run across situations where you're going to be asked to, or you're going to be in a position where you can offer a solution. And virtual environments is an excellent sandbox for you to be able to configure it, set it up, so that you may have users who don't want to move to a new uh, platform, you know, maybe Windows 11 or Windows 12, where you can set up a virtual environment, put Windows 12 on it, let them play around, don't worry about it, let them get comfortable, and then, uh, then I say, okay, now I'm ready for you to upgrade my machine, you know, to Windows 11, 12, because I had an opportunity to get comfortable. But the same thing with applications. Uh, if you if you're using your personal computer at home, and you don't want things to mess up because you're in school, well, set mm -hmm. it up in virtual, and then you can put other things to play around in a virtual environment, and it never messes with your data on the host. It's all in a virtual environment. One of the things I used to like to do is uh, I would literally set up maybe two or three Windows 10 and let people log on, my guests and visitors on in that environment in case they did something. It never messed with my machine because I had my homework and other things on it. I would just let them log into a virtual environment, give them access to the web, and if they messed it up, it's no worries. I could just rebuild it or or whatever. Also, the last thing I'll say is that remember when we created those VHDX files? Mm -hmm. You could literally create one of those on your home computer, copy it, put it on a jump drive, go to another machine, import that in, and everything you've created 
and you open it up, when there's tend to be on it, all the documents you had in on it, and things like that, you can import that into another system. Or you can have it as a backup in case anything fails. You can say, no worries, I got a backup copy of this VHDX. If anything fails in virtual, I can just scrap that, import this other one in, and I'm, I'm, I'm up and going within five minutes. You know, so it really has a lot of solutions, and that's what the cloud environment really is. It's just a bunch of virtual machines out there on the cloud. Okay. You know, and, 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 and so as you guys are coming into it, that's all they're doing. They're just using a virtual environment software that's emulating hardware. That's what a virtual, and now I don't have to buy a Linux box. I don't have to buy three different Windows 10. I can do it virtually and I can have eight different machines and it costs me zero dollars, but I could run Linux, I can run Windows 10, I can run Windows 7. That's what virtual does, it saves people money. And that's the big thing about virtual. So, Okay. Now that we kind of covered that, that's what we're going to do is we're going to actually create in a virtual environment a RAID. And we're going to mirror it, and we're going to do a lot of cool stuff. We're going to assign drive letters to it. We're actually going to cause one of those mirrors to fail and, and, and things like that. And then we're going to go into some more command line, but it's going to be disk partitioning so that you can fix. Um, they're going to show you two environments where you can use this manage uh, this management in order to uh, to do this, but they're also going to let you do some of the same things you can do in disk management, do it in a command line, so that um, you can kind of compare both of them. So we're going to jump right in. I'm going to go ahead if everybody's ready. I'm going to go ahead and play this next video, and we're at step nine. Uh, we're coming down. We only got on page 87. We're on step nine, and here we go. No worries, I have this backed up. I can play it on a different. Give me one second, I will um, get this going. Is that you? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's on my end. Um, having some playback issues but it's it's no worries I can get this going I have it I have this actually backed up in another location so just give me one second um, I'm gonna log into my server And this is just some extra stuff you guys can see. Uh, I actually have a, a network attached storage at home, which I can I utilize as a web server and a lot of different things. So. Um, one day I would love to do a, a demo on this so that you guys can um, maybe one day think about investing in one of these. This really comes in handy or a lot of things. Um,
Can y'all see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can't keep a good man down. I always got. But no matter what goes on. We're going to actually do this live. So I'm going to go into disk management. Now, as you can see here, I've, this is the completion of the lab that I've actually executed. So what I'm going to do, if you give me a second, just um, I'm going to set this. And then we're going to actually I'm going to start back from beginning and um, Okay, one second, gentlemen. I'm gonna fix this real quick, and then we'll we'll, we'll pick up uh, this lab. I'm kind of, in some ways, I'm really kind of glad you guys are watching this because it gives me an opportunity to show you how, you know, I would actually troubleshoot something in the beginning, and how to set this up. Uh, this is gonna shut down. So what I'm gonna do, go back in, is I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna create that disk. Um, and then we'll actually do this, do this lab live. So what I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to go to PC1 and I'm going to minimize this so you can see it. And I'm going to come over here into settings, check the settings on it. As you can see, I have two hard drives on here. I'm going to go ahead and remove them. Remove here, click OK. And then I'm going to come back in the settings and I'm going to add some. Oh, now this to answer that question before because I'm going to actually show you where those hard drives exist. I'm going to go to Windows C, go into uh, Lab Files. Go into Temp. And that's where they actually exist. And I'm going to delete them out of there. Now these are both 8 gigabytes. And I'm going to delete them out 
and just start over from scratch. So now I'm going to come back over here to PC1. Um, and if I want to reset it back to the way it was at the beginning, I click on revert. And that just sets the whole lab up to the way it was. So I go into settings. I go into memory. I'm going to change that memory. I'm going to give it two gigs of memory, 2048. Then I'm going to do that exercise again. I'm going to add a hard drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Grade A. Put it back in the temp. Next. Make it 8 gigs. And finish. Now come back over to SCSI, add new. Nice. Great. See? And then I'm going to make that ready when I'm done. It's going to go in that folder there. Click next. Make that eight gigs. And finish. Okay. So now that I've got my settings, I've got my memory. This is actually what you would do if you, you remote it in. Click apply. Mm -hmm. Click OK. Now everything's set the way I want it. If I had other changes, I could go into settings and make those. Now I'm going to go ahead and click connect. Start it up. Now. And then I'm going to go into disk management. I'm going to go ahead and um, format it, that OneDrive, and then we'll be ready to start this lab, and we'll just do it live that way. Um, now, what I'm going to do, once, once I format that first hard drive into an NTFS, I'm going to put some data on it. The reason I want to put data on it, because when we make it a RAID, and combine it and do the things that we need to do. I want you, and part of the lab is to demonstrate that the data didn't get corrupted or it didn't get lost. So if there's data on it prior to it, once we run this exercise, I want you to see that the data is still going to be on that RAID, um, going to be on that drive, even after we make it a RAID. So I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, if I, if I do this and there's data on it, will it get corrupted or will I lose it or whatever. Now, when you do remote in and do these labs, I want you all to know that all of the all of the virtual all of the machines that you're going to be remoting into, they have 16 gigs of RAM on them. OK, on the host system. So if you want to increase the memory and make it pop a little bit faster, just know that your host has 16 and whatever RAM your virtual is going to use is going to be splitting with it. So, hey, you know, you don't have to just leave it at at one gig. You can say, I'm going to bump it up for this lab to eight gigs if I want to. And hey, eight, go ahead. Sorry, Derek. A quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you keep saying lab. Uh, is it going to be such that we can uh, ultimately, is your goal to, at, at some degree, do either or both the activities and the labs? Because those are two separate things. Yes, the activities, the, what we're doing, as you can see up here, it says virtual machine. Those are Hyper-Vs. Those are the activities. And when you do the labs that we're actually doing here, and you remote in to do these activities, they have 16 gigs of RAM on them. Oh, that all I get. I, I totally understand that. But when, you, when, you, when you remote in to do your labs that are part of your courseware that are going to be Oracle, all those machines have eight gigs of RAM. Okay. Okay. And I just want to make a distinction. So what we're doing here, you just know that when I'm doing these, 
activities, those are 16 gigabyte systems. When you're doing your regular ones, and once I circle back and start doing those, and you remote in to do those labs, those only have, at the present time, they only have eight gigs of RAM. So that's kind of what you know what you're working with. And that just, you know, I just wanted to kind of make you guys aware of, you know, what you're going to be dealing with. So I'm going to go back into disk management. It should detect those two, two that I just built. And I'm going to go ahead and make this full screen so we can kind of see it a little bit more clearly. Okay, there we go. Click OK. Now I'm going to go back and set it up the way it was before. Make it a simple volume. Leave it there. I believe it was drive L. Next, I believe this was lab files here and finish. And so it's going to format that on there. So now live files, I'm going to go into here to show you where it created in this interface here. And if I scroll, you see here it is, lab files L. And what I want to do just for sake of, I'm going to go ahead and just I'm going to copy one folder. I don't need all of it to demonstrate what I'm doing. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it in this folder here. Just to just to have data in it. Um, let me see if there's anything inside of that. Yeah, there's that there. So when we when we make this raid, we want to make sure that it didn't corrupt that data there. So now we're ready to get started. So now they want me to go back into uh, what I'm already in disk management. Okay, now it said right click on disk one. Oh, let me show you this real quick. So you can see one, that's the second disk. It's unallocated, this NTFS 7.9 is healthy. So they said right click here, convert to dynamic disk. Okay, now it says check disk two for this here because we're going to make a raid. That's what we're doing. Make a dynamic, well, we're, got, we're making these both dynamic at this point. And, and convert them and then click yes. So we're making them um, dynamic. So you wanna do that, but we're not done there. Now, once we made them dynamic, it says right click here. And then what we wanna do here is it says add mirror. So it's telling us in the instructions, um, right click on the lab files, add a mirror, select this two add the mirror. So it's going to basically the data that I put on here is going to be backed up here. That's what array will do. I, I can only put, this is going to take a while, it's going to do its thing. In terms of content, I can only put eight gigs even though I've got two, uh, two eight and it's 16 gigs. Because I created a mirror, I'm just making my system so that whatever data I put on there I'm being, I'm, it's automatically going to be backed up on this second disk here. That's what, it, that's the RAID environment we do, which is a RAID 1. Uh, Derek? Yeah. I recently created a RAID 1 for my system here, mm -hmm. exactly what we're doing. But, uh, you know, I had to call into Microsoft because I was on, you know, I had a couple of issues and I couldn't figure out, and, and according to them, you can't do it. I, I'm hoping you know a trick. We don't have to get into it tonight, but uh, okay. where you can verify that 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 mirrored drive is actually reflecting those files, because because I can't see it in Windows 10. I got Windows 10 Pro, and I don't know of a way to, you know, maybe in a command line or something I can see. Well, it. we're actually, I'm glad you're in this lect lecture because we're going to break the mirror. Okay. And see what happens. That's part of what this lab is going to do. Okay. And then you'll we'll, we'll see what happens because that's the point of a RAID 1 is that if one of them fails, yeah. you don't lose your data. And we're going to make one fail, and we're going to see if we lose our data. Okay? So that's, that's actually what this lab is. So that's an excellent question. So now we've added the mirror. We see that it's healthy. And that's kind of what we want to see there. 
So now it says uh, right click on the volume and it says change drive letter and pass, which is here. So we're gonna, it says click the add button and then we're gonna browse. And then we're gonna navigate to see users public. So now we're going to make that L drive appear, see users public. And then it says new folder. Now we're going to call that again lab files. And then we're going to click OK. And then we're going to click OK. Now, what they want us to do now, before I show it to you, let me go back into this environment here. You know, we have lab files there, but they're also saying navigate this way to see users public. And you will see that you have a little icon that is pointing that your public folders, you got a little icon that's pointing to this lab files right here. So if you wanted to, you know, that's what that's did. So by making the path, we made it the path say C uses public, but that data that's going in there, uh, we can have it go into that lab files folder, which we know that's a RAID environment and all the data that we're putting in it. And if you see the size, that's about eight gigs right there, which you know that any data that's going in there, there is going to be backed up. And you did that all virtually. So even in a virtual environment, if you want to play around with raids and do things before you went live and went to production, you can actually test it and simulate it in a virtual environment. Then you could go and actually put two hard, two uh, hard drives in the system and things like that. But I just want you to know that this is what we're talking about there. So um, now we're going to actually break it. So we're going to come over here. They want us to right click and go into device manager. And that's going to come up. That's, that's another console called devices where you can see all of the hardware in your system and see how the hardware, if it's working. They want us to expand disk drives. They want us to see you, can see you got on your disk drives, you got three virtual disks. You know, you got the one where your main her, uh, operating system is running off of and those two recreated. They want us to go to this last one, and then they want us to, um, let me make sure I'm, I'm getting this right. We want to, um, on the last virtual disk, and they said disable the device. And it says disable this device will cause it to stop function. Do you really want to disable it? You click yes, and it's going to want to restart the computer. It's going to restart the virtual environment. Once we come out of that, they want us to log back into it, go into this uh, device manager, and I'll show you where that mirror is actually broken. Why, so, why were there three uh, virtual disks in there? Well, remember, your first virtual disk is running Windows 10 virtually. Oh, okay. 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 So now I'm glad you, you asked me that because let me pull it over here. And let me go into settings and show it to you. Okay. That hard drive right there, that's what's running Windows 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what we log into. These two we added. You remember us adding those two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that one on top is not the host. That's virtual yeah. as well. Yeah, that's the virtual, yes. Okay. So... So when we look at the um, hardware inside of the virtual machine, it's only reading the hard drive we attached, which is going to show it's a simulated DVD drive, a hard drive, and then those two we added. So when we went in there, it showed us these three hard drives. But this is what Windows 10 is running on. These are the two we added, RAID A and RAID B. You follow me, Mike? I think so. Okay. I'm a little, I'm a little, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll work through it. I'm a little sketchy on the host virtual thing, but. Okay. Now, when I talk about host, just to be clear, everyone, 
the host is this right here. That's Windows 10 I'm running on my machine. Now, sometimes people do get kind of familiar, um, it can get tangled up, but what I, I want to use an analogy to show you what I'm talking about virtual. Because we go through things every day, and then when we come into IT, they don't make a lot of sense. Now, when have you seen two people inside of one person? If you were from another planet and we said, well, uh, how can you have two people in one body. What's an example of that in everyday life? Well, somebody with schizophrenia, maybe. No, somebody who's pregnant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you ever heard eating for two? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so what you have, when I say host, that's mama. Out here, this is mama, right here. Windows 10, I'm running. Inside of mama, here are the babies. Mm. You ever you ever see a sonogram? Oh yeah. Okay, but this is a sonogram. This Hyper-V manages a sonogram of the babies inside of mama. Okay. Y'all follow me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So in here we have an oct octo mom. You see all of these different virtual machines inside? Basically, you're looking at a sonogram. And each time, if we want to look at a picture of it, that's the picture of the baby inside of that. If I switched over here, that's, that's, and each time I open it up, now this one is running, but I have these virtual machines inside. So again, just like in a mother, you have an umbilical cord that's attached to the child. As she eats, it feeds the child, right? Right. Okay, we get that. We understand that. So if she's taking alcohol or whatever, well, Hyper-V Manager is the umbilical cord to these machines right here. Do y'all follow me? Right. Now, again, I come over here and I share the resources with Ma of Mama. I'm going to go back in the settings. And so... Again, mama has 16 gigs of memory, but I'm going to share part of her memory with the child. So she loses 2048, which is two gigs. I'm sharing that with PC1. And I can do that with other things. If I want to come over here and I want to share her internet, I can come over here, I can switch it, and when I put it on default switch, that will give it... Uh, the internet that mama's using, now I'm gonna leave it on there just so you can see, and I'm gonna come back over here and connect to it. And now all of a sudden when I log in, you'll see that I have internet access, which I didn't have before because I turned on the switch. I know this is away from the lecture, but I, I'm glad I'm getting these questions because I can, use this as an environment to show you kind of what's going on and show you how the virtual machine is literally using the resources of the host, mama. Right. And that, that's what I was about to ask is by the same token, any resources that you share are going to have limitations, whether it's speed or throughput or yes, whatever the case may be that the, whatever the limitations of the host are. Or exactly. The okay. Yes. Because Mama only, she has all the resources. So whatever limitation she has, the virtual can't do more than that. You know, I can only share part of my body with you. So as I eat, you know, if, uh, and whatever, I'm not trying to, you know, get too far, but I want you to, to understand that's what the virtual environment is doing is utilizing the resource of the host. So that's why I said earlier, know that when you remote in to do your activities, your host has 16 gigs of memory and you can share a bit you can use more resources on that but when you remote in to do your campus labs or your Azure labs those only have eight gigs of memory so you can only bump those up so much so now we're back into it and as you can see now the network I'm gonna make this full mode and it's basically saying that um,
Okay, and as you can see, now I have internet access access in the virtual environment. So if I were to click on here, I can go to websites and do all kinds of things there. But that's a little bit outside. But they want me to go back and show you. I'm going to right click, go back into device manager, and just prove to you that that raid that we created has been broken. And as you can see here, I don't know if I can make this any bigger, uh, that right here, you got a little symbol here, and it's going to show you that if I want to, I can enable it, but they want me to leave it broken there. Now that we've done that, let's go back over and see if we still have access to that data, even though the mirror has been broken. The problem is it's just not backing up. The data's there, but it's not being backed up now because we broke it. Now we can rebuild the mirror in another lab and rebuild it because when, when it breaks, you have to rebuild the mirror and stuff like that. But so they just kind of walked you through that to give you a taste of the fact that, hey, look, here's another tool. If you have a scenario where you have a client that's working in a virtual environment, they don't have enough space or they got data they can't afford to lose, you can go in, create some hard drives, create an array and tell them to put their information in there because if one of those eight fails, it's being backed up to give them assurances. You know, say, hey, look, even though you're in a virtual environment, we still can protect your data in this environment. And, and you can go back to the host and tell it to back up your virtual drives so if your entire system fails, you've got the whole virtual backed up and you can rebuild it in five minutes, okay? And that's something... Let me, we'll let me and I, I apologize if I... I don't want to take us on a rabbit trail, but... No, 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 no. Is that to say that this virtual environment could take the place because you, you used the you know you said the cloud is nothing but a virtual environment, mm -hmm. and so instead of paying my uh, subscription to Carbonite, right, or to one of these other third-party services, I can create my own backup that, and uh, uh, if and until I do a low-level format on the whole drive, if if it's see, I don't know. At some point, there's a partition for recovery, and I know that Windows 10 likes to do that. Are they creating? A, is that what they're really doing? Is that what that does? Is create a virtual drive and a small per partition on the drive? Basically, yeah. to answer your question. Yes, that's what they're doing. And, okay. you're, and, you're, and, you're, and, and again, you can simulate. Again, you can do a lot of these things yourself. So, just before we go with this lab, just to take thirty more seconds to show you kind of what we're talking about here is, I'm going to minimize my my virtual machine. And I'm going to minimize this here. Now, if I come up, if I created a backup, I know that on my C drive, I have a folder called lab files. And if I wanted to, I could back these up. In other words, I could run a backup and say backup RAID A, backup uh, RAID B. And I could put it on an external drive and just say, hey, back up to that. Let's say for some reason I go back into my virtuals and everything just messes up and it's not working the way I want it to, then I can simply take that backup, put it back on that hard drive, open this up and it would and my virtual will be going. So you can literally back up your whole virtual experience. Um, so here if I go into settings it tells me that my hard drive here is located in a folder called C CompTIA Labs Virtual Hard Disk. And the name of this is another VHD. So if I back up this file, no matter what happens in this lecture, everything crashes. If I've had that backed up, I could come back here, rebuild it, copy and paste it, and I'll be back up in five minutes. And so within the virtual, I'm actually doing it again and creating a RAID within the virtual. So I'm just I can have layer upon layer of protection, and that's what they're doing in a cloud environment. And, um, and those are all ISO files? No, they're not ISO files. They're okay. VHD, VHDX files. Now, when I first, okay. when I first uh, set up Windows, it took an ISO file and, and put that uh, and install Windows on that VHDX. So we're inside of a little universe here. Okay. Uh, but we'll, we'll, 
we'll we'll come back to all of that because you have an excellent okay. questions. But this I know. is I want you. I've already been through it. You're taking the pain away, and I can't <laughs> stop asking. <laughs> no, no. This is what this is for because this is a lecture slash study session slash going through the labs. So now that they've shown you that that we broke in, we created the mirror and broke it. Let's keep moving forward because this is what I want you guys really to see. Because right here I'm on step 11. Now we're going to go and we're going to use command line to address this hard, uh, the, the virtual drives that we created here. So I'm going to go in here and they want us to go into command. Uh, I'm going to go into command. I'm sorry. Let me type in command. I type in the command, I type in disk partition. But remember, it's only looking at the at the drives inside the virtual, not not my host. It's only looking inside that. The virtual machine doesn't know it's a virtual machine. It's it, it feels like it's a real machine, and it and it really is. So now we're in disk partition. So I'm gonna type in help, just so I can kind of get oriented to exactly what disk partition does. And it gives me a lot of things, a lot of commands that you can do. And you can kind of go through it and we're gonna be executing some of these commands. But again, we're not gonna do all these commands, but now that you can see some of the commands you can do, you might go out there and Google and say, a Google search disk, uh, disk partition file systems and see someone executing that. And you can learn a lot more about these commands. I'm not gonna say do all of them, but this lets you know that these are some of the commands you can do with disk partition, but they're gonna walk us through some of them right now. So now that we've done that, one of the commands they say is list. Right here, it says list. So we're gonna say list disk. And it's saying, okay, now while I'm doing that, what I wanna do so that you guys can definitely follow along is I'm going to open up this management because we're going to be doing in command line what we could be doing this way. We could do the same things in this environment, but they're going to teach you that if for some reason this isn't working properly, you can execute some of the same things you could do here. You can do them in command line. So again, it says disk zero, 64 gigs. Does anyone see a 60 disk zero has been partitioned and you see 64 gigs there, okay? So it's showing you this. I'm just kind of showing you this one right here, this one, eight gigs. You see it there. This MO missing. Why is that missing? We broke it. We broke it, yeah. Yeah, so it's showing you that. And coming back over here, you know, missing. So I'm just showing you that I want y'all to follow along because if you ever need, if you get lost in this disk partition, it's showing you that we could have done the same things this way. They're just showing you another tool. You know, uh, a lot of times this sometimes may be a way that you can troubleshoot things because sometimes Windows 10 could be corrupt or crashing and the only way you can do it is through disk partition. So let's move on. Okay, so now that we've done that, it says select disk zero do that it says it's selected now it says give me the detail on that disk so disk zero is this zero and now i've got the details on it now again i got the details of disk zero which is this here and it's showing me recovery recovery disk c 63 64 gigs ntfs 99 you don't right there. Now here it doesn't show you that it's FAT32, but in this environment it's showing you that it's formatted as FAT32. So if you got a question on what tool you could use to see that, I want you to see that this disk partition is going to give you a little bit more details, even yeah, though you can see it here. This is going to tell you that this shows the NTFS, the NTFS. This says healthy. But even if I expanded it out, it's not showing me that it's FAT32. This environment, you can see that. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
All right, so let's keep moving. So, list partition. Now, partitions is kind of just simply referring to, like even it's on disk zero, this is like a, a, a chest of drawer. This is one partition, that's another partition, like drawers in a, on a, in a desk, on, on a desk. Like we have a, we have a sock drawer, we have one for underwear. Well, it's all one desk, but we have drawers in it. So when you see that word partition, think about another word, drawers. Okay, it's on disk zero, but list the partitions. So again, it's showing you again, list partition. Recovery, we've seen it again, and it's giving us the specs on that, primary, reserved, or whatever. Two different environments, same thing. Okay, now it says list, let me go back into here, list partition, now list volume. Okay, so now I'm looking at uh, all of the things on here. Let me come back into here. What would your, I love your analogies and your, and your metaphors. Uh, what would you call volume in, this, in the context of well, your? That's what I'm showing you here is that when it says list volume, I want you to see that it's showing you that your volume is including the CD-ROM, the missing, this one, this zero. So over here, when we say list the volume, you have, uh, and also that is showing you where we mapped uh, that, that mirror drive to lab, lab files. And that's showing you the location that we typed in. We mapped that location to that volume for that. This is referring to the DVD-ROM. Okay, this is for, again, the 529, you see the 63 gig, and that's your boot, and then this is your, your uh, FAT32. So now if you want to see like, okay, in this environment, show me all of the storage points in the volume. Well, the volume is not just, let me bring this forward. Okay, it's this zero, this one, scroll down, the missing, and the CD-ROM. That's all the areas that I have as potential areas that I can store my hard drive DVD-ROM to show me the whole volume, okay, of, of that. So that would be the volume. So you're not just looking at the chest of drawer with the drawers in it, you're looking at the entire bedroom, the volume, what's all in the bedroom. I got this chest of drawer here with three drawers in it. I have this one over here mapped to there. I have a broken one and I have a DVD wrong. The, so reason I, the only reason I ask is that it's thrown me off in the past when I was actually doing this to a physical hard drive and I, and it, so I guess volume relates to the uh, the logical aspect of the physical hard drive then because the hard drive is the volume, is right. the bedroom, right? Yeah, the hard drive isn't the bedroom. It's, it's, it's one of them, that's one of the, like I said, this is represents a chest of drawer with three drawers in that chest of drawer. Right. This, yeah. And the logical, like you say, it's logical C. This is logical L, you know, combined here. And this logical is, is, is um, I believe, D. But the volume is representing the entire, what the contents of the entire bedroom. So, if, so I would look at all three of, of, of these being furniture in one bedroom, and that's going to be the volume. And I can say list the volume to show me that. But then they're going to break it down. If I need details on each one of these, I have a way through disk partitioning where I can look at the details of each one. But if I need to do it in this environment and I didn't have this open at all, I can see it in this environment here. Okay, so let's keep it rolling. So now, now that I've done that, let's go back into here and I, it says select partition two. Partitions or drawers. So some 
Hopefully I spell this right. I'm sure I didn't spell that right. Okay, it's selected. And you always wanna see that to know that you've got it right. It always will give you back. And so now I'm gonna do the detail on that. So, uh, select partition two. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't type it. I was supposed to type in detail partition. Sorry. Okay, now that gives me, now I've isolated on partition two. Fat 32, 99. So I can select partitions and get, I select it and then I can get the details on that. I don't have to keep going back and forth on this to confuse you, but I want you to see that you could use that other one just to kind of follow along. So I'm gonna go ahead and select or drawer three. Detail volume. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not typing these in right. I'm sorry, select volume three, and then I'm sorry. So again, I listed the volumes and it showed me all of them. Now I'm selecting a specific uh, volume, select volume three, um, and then I'm getting the detail on that. Um, now I'm gonna go back and select disk one, and I'm following along in the instructions. It said it's now selected. Then I'm gonna have a detail of the disk that I selected, and it's gonna tell oh, me. Oh, oh. And it's showing me that, you know, it's failed uh, and how it's mapped there. Um, now what it wants me to do is assign the letter T to change the letter. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I skipped a step. Select volume zero. Now that's selected and then I'm supposed to put detail volume. And here, that's when I can assign letter Okay, so I, I selected volume zero, and that's the main volume, and then it says now list volume, and as you can see now it changed it, that the one that we had as lab files, it changed it to T, but if I were to go back into here, it should well, it hasn't shown it yet, but it's going to show that, that, that is, that's going to be T. So if I come back over in here, you can see where our lab files is now T. And the data is still there. Now, it wants me to, coming down the home stretch, it wants me to, I'm back into this partition. It says, uh, I'm going to, Remove mount equal to the C drive. I'm going into users. I'm going to that public folder we mapped it to. 
And I'm gonna say lab files, which we created earlier. And it's gonna remove the mount that we did. It successfully did that. It says it wants us to exit, but it wants me to keep this open here. It wants me to, uh, the instructions say it wants me to navigate to C, uh, users, public, and lab files. And here it's the data is present. Um, it says now an ordinary empty folder, the way I'm, I navigate it, it shows that it's empty if we navigate this way, but the data is actually still there. It's just not mapped to that same path that we had done it before. It's not in the public folders. It's now just, since we unmounted it, it's still, the data is still in its lab files, but we can't map to it the way we did before because we had created a link to it to navigate to users public lab files. Well, it doesn't show anything there, but the data is still there on that drive there. And they want you to demonstrate that we simply created a link in, um, under the public folder so people could drop information. But if we didn't want to do that, then they can just drop it in directly into this lab file folder here. So now we're going to go in and uh, go back in the disk man. Uh, we're going to go back in the command line and we're going to actually format um, and do some command lines and actually do some formatting in command line. So now it wants us to go. Now I'm not in disk partition anymore. I'm back into just a command prompt. So they're going to purposely give us a command that should not work. And that's, I'm going to format logical drive T and I'm going to say formatted as a fat 32. And it says, hey, you don't have the privileges to do that. So in order to, to have the privileges, they want me to exit out, type in command again. But before I actually click on it, they want, they want you to hit control shift, enter. So that's what I'm gonna do, control shift, enter. Uh, that's going to elevate the privileges, and I can show you another way to do that. Now, if I type in that command, um, T, I'm sorry, format, drive T, FS, FAT32, and then it says, okay, um, you want to enter the label in as lab files. And proceed, yes. And it's going to format it. It's showing you. OK, and then it wants us to name that tools. Okay, and when we're done, and so that pretty much does it. So the last thing I have to show you is that formatting. If I go back over here, now you have a folder called tools, and it's formatted as a FAT32 now. So if I went back into disk management, tools, FAT32, and it's still broken, and we'd have to rebuild it and stuff like that, but it's now um, done that way. And so... Again, this lab was just to demonstrate that, you know, hey, these are some of the, you know, you've done a lot, you know, you've, you know, you've created hard drives, we've uh, looked at other file sharing permissions and, and done other command line tools in this. So, again, the scenario was in this activity, uh, you will add and configure storage devices for the virtual machines and use file management tools. We've kind of walked through that. You might, you know, like I said, you know, you feel like you got a good handle on it, that's great. But this is just kind of an idea of some of the questions that you might see on your cert if you hadn't actually done a lab. Now you have a better feel for what tool to use to execute whatever scenario they give you. 
by going through this lab there. Um, but it's great to kind of do some of these things on your own and mm -hmm. go back there. But whenever you're done with the lab, a little housekeeping, uh, they always ask that now that we're done, we close out and we shut it down. Just to kind of show you when you leave a lab, they always mm -hmm. end every one of these labs this way. So once this shuts down, um, Okay, now we're done. They're saying you, you select that and to reset the, the lab to back to the way it was when you first began, you click on revert, revert it back, and it puts it back the way it was at the very beginning. So again, I want you to know that because no matter what you're doing in a virtual environment, if you go in there and you mess everything up, revert it back. Okay. And it's back the way it was when you first set it up. So <laughs> it's really a sandbox. You know, once you get these virtual, you can go in there and go crazy. You can just screw everything up. You come over and click revert. It's back to the way it was when you first started. The only thing is that it didn't delete is if I come over here, I'm going to go into C and I'm going to go into this temp folder. Those hard drives are still there, eating up 16 gigs. I come over here, I delete them out. They're in my trash folder, you know, I, and I'm going to empty the trash. But if I left them in there, I could back those up and copy them. So if anything ever went wrong, I just put them back in there and okay. I'm good to go. Okay. So any questions?